Since the last Sunday of last year, we've been dipping into the book of Psalms. We've taken approximately one psalm out of every ten, and we've been having a selection, therefore, from this amazing and wonderful hymn book of the Christian Church of both Testaments. We come today to the last of our present series, and we look at Psalm 135. Now, let me remind you of some of the things that we've learned. From the second psalm, we learned that the kingdom of Christ shall never stop extending. From the eleventh psalm, we learned that the world will definitely be against us. Persecution is a fact of every Christian's experience. But persecution cannot stop us walking with God. From the 25th Psalm, we learn lessons about how to walk with God, as we learn lessons about prayer. We saw in the 37th Psalm that God has special things to say to his people in a materialistic age. In the 42nd Psalm, we looked at the godly heart from the inside, the godly heart exposed. And we weighed up whether we really have made spiritual progress in all the years that we claim to have been the Lord's people. In Psalm 44, we saw that it's our duty and privilege to remember what God has done in the past and to use that as a basis that God should awake in the present. In 61st Psalm, we saw that however great our troubles, we're safe because we live our lives under divine protection. We saw in the 76th Psalm that the Christian life isn't all troubles. So we learned how to greet blessing. In the 90th Psalm we thought about death, and we saw how a godly man thinks about that subject. Can God help me in my impossible situation? The answer to that was given in Psalm 107. Why is God's word so excellent? 119th Psalm told us that. Yes, we did do it in one week, for those of you who weren't here. And last week, in 129, we asked and answered the question, Can the Church of Christ survive? Well, we've studied such teachings, and it's your experience and mine that as we go through the book of Psalms, even in a selection, we feel at times, and in in fact we feel increasingly as we work through the book, that our hearts are going to burst. We feel that our hearts are going to burst because they simply cannot contain the joy and the comfort and the assurance which comes to our hearts as we study the book of Psalms. And that feeling persists as you go through the sacred hymn book And it increases as you get towards the end. So it's no surprise that as you get towards the end, you get less and less psalms on particular subjects, and more and more psalms which are nothing but pure praise. Hallelujah psalms. They start with, praise ye the Lord, or as it is in Hebrew, hallelujah. They end with, praise ye the Lord. Or as it is in Hebrew, hallelujah. And when we've worked our way through the book of Psalms, we feel that if those weren't there, then how could we possibly express our praise to God? But in his kindness, he gives us these hallelujah Psalms so that we can praise him even on earth in a way which is acceptable to him. Well, the first of these hallelujah Psalms and the last Psalm in our series is Psalm 135. And this is a psalm then for all of us who've ever said to ourselves, I want to praise the Lord, but I simply do not have the words with which to do it. Now if you look at this psalm which I read to you, Psalm 135, you'll see that it's it's a sort of sandwich. It starts with a call to praise. That's the first three verses. And it ends with a call to praise. That's the last three verses. 
But the main body, the real meat, if you like meat sandwiches, the real filling is in the middle. It starts with a call to praise, it ends with a call to praise, but the middle of the psalm is causes for praise. It's a very simple structure. And therefore we're going to look at it now. It is, I say again, the psalm for all of you who've ever said, I wish I knew how to praise the Lord. It's a psalm for all of you who said, I badly want to express my worship, but I don't have any satisfactory words of my own. Look then with me at the first three verses. This is a call to praise. What does the psalmist call on others to do? Praise the Lord, he says five times in those first three verses. Now the Hebrew word praise is not the same as the word for giving thanks. Thanksgiving is not the same as praise. Expressions of gratitude, although we must have them and must perform them, are not the same as praise. What does this word praise mean? We've just sung that God will fill our lives with praise. Well, the Hebrew word for praise, frankly, means to make a noise. It means to make a noise, which is a rebuke to some of you immediately, because you didn't make very much in the first few hymns today. It means to celebrate. It means to rejoice in. It means to speak well of. It means to enthusiastically admire. Or, as we would put it in simple modern English, it means to applaud. Applaud the Lord. It means, in other words, to think high thoughts and then to express those thoughts outwardly. That's what we're called upon to do in this psalm. Now, why do you think the psalmist calls on others to join him? Well, some of you will moan at the illustration, but it's the only one that came to me. So, here he goes. Here you are in your favourite football stadium. There is your favourite footballer. I pity you, but that is it. And there's been such a movement of skill that it's taken your breath away. And now the goal has been scored. And you burst into shouting and cheering and clapping. But when you look round on the terrace, you're the only one there. We won't ask who you support. <laughs> and you feel that it's all so empty. You're cheering, you're clapping. It just hasn't done justice to what you've just witnessed and seen. It seems all so empty. And you feel that the only way that it could have been even remotely done justice to is if there had been hundreds and thousands of others there who could have joined with you. Isn't it a shame that people show that much enthusiasm about a bag of wind going in between three sticks and when it comes to these eternal themes... There's nothing even remotely bordering on it. But this is the way the psalmist thinks. He wants to celebrate the Lord. He wants to applaud the Lord. When everything that he is has been put into it, if others don't join him, it seems such an empty thing. It seems so, so poor. It doesn't do the great God of heaven justice. So that's why the psalm opens with this call to praise the Lord. He's not content to do it on his own. And nor are you. It's a fact of Christian experience that however much you may praise the Lord on your own, you long to be with God's people. You may have enjoyed singing that hymn or psalm or on your own. How much more you enjoy it when you come together with others and your tongues unite to praise the Lord. And it's one of the facts of Christian experience that that's one of the reasons that we long for heaven. 
Because we feel even when we're in the largest congregation we've ever been in our life, that it is still not enough to celebrate him. And we long for the time when believers from every generation and all parts of the world will in perfection unite to praise the Lord. That's why the psalm opens with this call to praise. Look at who he asked to join him. Verse 1. Ye servants of the Lord. He's gone into the temple specifically to engage in praise. He sees some priests. Ask them to join with him. Verse 2. Ye that stand in the house of the Lord in the courts of the house of our God. In the same temple are Levites. He asks them to join him. So there are other people who are already there for the same purpose. People who are spiritually minded. And he calls upon them to join with him to applaud and celebrate Jehovah. And what reasons does he give them? Well, verse 3 is sufficient to give you a lifetime of praise. Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. And if you as a private Christian were to sit down and start recording the goodness of God to you as an individual alone, there is enough for a lifetime of praise. Then record God's goodness to your family and friends and local church and the Church of Christ, and the Church of Christ throughout all the ages, and then record God's goodness to the fallen angels even, that he has not destroyed them yet, to the unconverted, he still sends upon them fruitful seasons, and good things to enjoy. And you'll see that the Lord is good. But there's another reason. Verse 3. It is pleasant... Praise is its own reward, says Matthew Henry. The very act of praising is a source of pleasure to believers. It pleases and stimulates and warms the heart. So the psalm opens with a call to praise. And I ask you directly, how much does that call to praise interest you? Of how much interest is it to you? Do you feel that you would like to issue a similar call to praise the Lord? Or when you hear this call to praise, do you wish to respond to that call? Do you find that your heart warms to the idea of celebrating your God? Then I tell you with much joy that you have a spiritual heart. Whatever else a Christian man is, whatever else a Christian woman is, they are people of praise. As people have I formed for myself, says the Lord, that they might live to my praise. Whatever other feature there is in a regenerate heart, in a heart which has been made new by the gospel, whatever other features are there, this feature is always found there. This great desire to celebrate, to applaud and to lift high the Lord. However, if when you've heard this call to praise, you're still content to be an observer, you're content that others should get on with their praising of God while you watch, that they should join together, but you're content not to join them. After this long series of psalms, this may yet be the psalm which finds you out and which shows you that you're not truly numbered amongst the people of God. That you really are, despite all pretenses, an outsider. Because although they find pleasure, it's pleasant to praise the Lord. And although they cannot keep their minds closed to the goodness of God, you don't belong in that company, not really. You're still apart from them then it may be a psalm of praise which shows you the hypocrisy of your heart and the counterfeit nature of your faith and which brings you to realize this morning that this great God is not truly your God. And it may be a Sunday morning teaching message is the sermon which finds you out 
and causes you to go home this lunchtime and to find a quiet place and to say, Oh God, I've called you my God for years, but I found out this morning that you're not really my God because I don't have the spiritual desires which godly people have. God in Jesus Christ, be merciful to me, a sinner. Well, here is a call to praise. Now let's look at the great body of the psalm, which is causes for praise. Sometimes you meet Christians who say, Praise the Lord! Hallelujah! Blessed be his name! Well, that's all right. Don't worry about that. But do worry about it if they never give you a because. Because in the Bible, all praise has content. As our forefathers put it, it has matter. It's made up of something. In the Bible, godly people think like this. God is to be praised because. And the because is part of their prayer of praise. There are causes because. There are causes for praise. And empty ascriptions of praise are not true to the biblical idea of worship. In, the wor in, in biblical worship, people are enthusiastic, certainly, but they advance strong reasons why God should be worshipped. Look at verse 4. God is to be praised as the electing God. Of all the people in the world, he chose Jacob. He chose the sons of Jacob, Israel. Of all the nations in the world, he chose them. For himself. To be his. To be his peculiar treasure. It's a lovely picture. You've walked past those jewellers, haven't you? Some of you ladies, you'd like some of those things in the jeweller's window. Sorry about that. But the picture here, is of someone choosing something. In this case, it was a very rough cast, ugly thing, but taking it home and shining it up so that it is his own special treasure. His. Now, Israel and Jacob, as you know, is only an Old Testament picture of the church. Of all the people in the world, God chose you. Of all those better people in the world, God seems to have passed so many of them by, but he chose you. He set his love upon you and chose you to be one of that great international nation, if I can use that word, which are a people for himself. That's a great cause for praise. How sad, those of you who don't believe in election. You've lost one of the great biblical causes for praise. Because you must praise yourself. Because you think you chose God, although he insists that you didn't choose him, he chose you. You must congratulate yourself that you chose him and your heart can never be prostrate in worship that he chose you. But no, says the psalmist, God is to be praised as the electing God. We have this great privilege that he himself put his love upon us and we're his peculiar treasure. Verse 5, God is to be praised as the God of gods. Now listen to what this psalmist says in a cynical pagan world. For I know that the Lord is great and that our Lord is above all gods. Around him they were worshipping poles and images and sun and moon and spirits but there's a confidence about faith. And around us today, they worship almost anything but and have high regard for almost everything but the living and true God, their maker. And yet we live in that pagan world with the sweet confidence of faith. I know that the Lord is great. So despite all the cynicism, great indeed, infinite, Eternal. 
unchangeable. A God who has being in himself. Wise, just, powerful, holy, good and true. No God like him. Above all gods, there is no comparison between him and anything else for which people, men and women, have high regard. Unique and alone is God. That's his cause for praise. That is the foundation of praise, isn't it? That only God is God. Look at verses 6 and 7. God is to be praised as the God of the whole world. Whatever verse you may or may not remember, please remember verse 6. The person who ponders on verse 6, his whole Christian life changes. Whatsoever the Lord pleased, that did he. Whatsoever the Lord pleased, that did he. God, friends, has absolute power. He not only may do what he pleases, he does. The simple recognition of that enormous truth is life-changing. He does do what he pleases. Not only can nobody dictate to God, there is nobody who does. Not only can nobody control God, there is nobody who does. Not only can nobody influence God, there is nobody who does. Not only can nobody manipulate God, there is nobody who does. Whatsoever the Lord pleased, that did he. And that absolute sovereignty is universal. Look at verse 6. In heaven... Find the farthest galaxy that you can find. God is doing what he pleases there. In earth, what in this world, with its nuclear weapons, its suspicion, its robbery and its crime? Yes, God is as surely in control of this wicked world as he was in control of Golgotha when wicked men, guilty men, spiteful men crucified the Lord of glory and fulfilled his predeterminate counsel. Yes, he's even in control on earth. In the seas, and all deep places. And then he gives us some examples. Look at verse 7. You see the clouds forming. Somewhere there over the Atlantic Ocean, they're forming now. It's not just because there are laws which have been set into motion and they just go and God stands back from his universe and watches the whole computer tick. The reason that there are laws is not because man has invented them, but they observe that there's a certain consistency about the universe. And there's a certain consistency about the universe because all those things are direct acts of God. The forming of the clouds over the Atlantic is a direct act of God. Verse 7, the lightning when the rain is upon us is a direct act of God. The wind comes out of his treasuries, even the direction of the wind, the speed with which it blows, its temperature and its effects are all personally in the hands of God. Marvellous, isn't it? God is not to be identified with those things. He is separate from them. But nonetheless, he is perfectly in control of them. Yes, scientists can observe it and formulate the, what they observe and call what they call laws. But they must never forget that God acts in a consistent manner and these things are all direct of, acts of God. Which is why, of course, they must not despise or gape when sometimes God departs from his normal ways of providence and does an extraordinary act of providence, which is called generally a miracle. Look at verses 8 to 12. God is to be praised as the electing God. He's to be praised as the God of gods. He's to be praised as the God of the whole world. Verses 8 to 12. He's to be praised as the God of history. 
History is not just happenings. It is divinely directed. Those plagues which fell on Egypt, verses 8 and 9, but which did not fall upon Israel. The destruction of various ancient civilizations, verses 10 and 11. The entry of, it seems, a motley rabble into fortified Canaan, verse 12. It's all an act of God. There's no explanation except a divine explanation. God is working out all history for the good of his people. And God is still working out all history for the good of his people. Look at verses 13 and 14. God is to be praised as the God of glory and of grace. Verse 13. We live in a world where events take place. Where generations come and generations go. Where empires rise and empires fall. But in this changing universe there is one great unchangeable. Verse 12. I beg your pardon. Verse 13. Thy name, O Lord, endureth forever. His name is his intrinsic character. He endures forever. He's remembered, we read in the same verse 13, from generation to generation. Whoever else is forgotten, God is not, you know. Whatever other memories of people you have and what other great names of history you've read about, in every human breast there is still the consciousness of God because he is the fact of existence. And this God, verse 14, is on the side of his people. Verse 14 means he judges for them. He will not permit them to be obliterated. We learned this last week. It's simply because of the unchangeableness of God and of the righteousness of God that God's people cannot and will never be obliterated from the face of the earth. Their security lies in their union with him. And however far they've wandered, verse 14, he will return to them again and again in mercy. And he'll do them good, just like he has done throughout history. God is to be praised, verse 15 to 18, as the living God. I love to read verses 15 to 18. Let's read it again. The idols of the heathen are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes have they, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. Neither is there any breath in their mouths. They that make them are like unto them. So is everyone that trusteth in them. Contrast God. Does he speak? Yes, with the voice that wakes the dead. Does he see all things as they are all the time? Does he hear? He hears everything. And before a word is on my tongue, he knows it all together. Is he made? No. But he is the maker of all. Is he lifeless? No, he alone has life in himself. And all that has life owes it to him. How foolish to worship an idol. How stupid, how senseless to fashion it out of silver and gold with my own hands and then to call it my God. I'll only become like it. How wise and spiritual and good to worship him, the one who is alone God. Which leads us naturally to the close of the psalm. It began with a call to praise. God is to be praised, we're told then, as the electing God, as the God of gods, as the God of the whole world, as the God of history, as the God of glory and grace, as the living God. And so the psalm ends with a call to praise. If he is so different as he is, how could I refrain from praising him? And so the whole of the remainder is a call to us to set about acts of praise. Bless the Lord, O house of Israel, that nobody in the nation do anything else except set about acts of praise. 
Bless the Lord, O house of Aaron. Let no priest be slow in praise. Bless the house, O house of Levi. Let nobody who serves in the temple be backward in this great duty and privilege of praise. And then this lovely verse, verse 20, which talks about most of you. Ye that fear the Lord, bless the Lord. The psalm was originally sung by ancient Israel. Most of the believers in Old Testament times were Jews. But here, having addressed the whole nation and the priests and the Levites, he addresses those that fear the Lord, knowing full well that not all praising people come from amongst the Jews. It's a foretaste of the ingathering of the Gentiles, which has since taken place. And we too are invited and commanded to praise the Lord. Blessed be the Lord out of Zion, which dwelleth in Jerusalem. Let the whole of Zion be taken up with this task. Praise ye the Lord. Did you sing in that second, that last hymn that we sang, that you wanted to praise God with your life, but you also said that you wanted to praise him with your lip? And yet you find it so difficult, especially on your own. And you long to do it especially in corporate worship with others. Again and again in your Christian life you ask the question, but how do I praise the Lord? This is how to do it. This is the way.